Thank you, Emily. Um, well, welcome to conversation number four. My name is Hazel Carby, and I teach literature here at Yale in the Department of African American Studies. Um, I'd like to thank Emily for issuing the call that has brought us all together today, but I'd also like to thank all of you for responding to Emily's call um, in such numbers and with such enthusiasm. So let me introduce the members of the panel this afternoon. And we will go in alphabetical order for the presentations. On my left is Elizabeth Alexander, who is um, a poet and literary critic and professor of African American studies here at Yale. To Elizabeth's left is Nikki Finney, also a poet and a professor of creative writing at the University of Kentucky. And then to Nikki's left is Marilyn Nelson, another poet and professor emeritus of creative writing at the University of Connecticut at Storrs. And then last but not least, we have at the end of this table, Yolanda Pierce, who is the Elmer G. Homringhausen, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Associate Professor of African American Religious, Religion and Literature at Princeton Theological Seminary. So first of all, let me remind everybody about what the question is that we're first going to hear the panelists consider and that you will then respond to. The question, how does the shape of a vowel the placement of space and words on the page, signal the spiritual in your work or in the work of those whom you admire. And I think this, this is an occasion uh, for the incredibly sort of talented and creative people here this afternoon on this panel to reflect quite broadly too about what is meant by uh, the spiritual in terms of the sources of both inspiration and creativity in their work. So first, please, Elizabeth Alexander. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. And I just want to join in the chorus of thanks for Emily Towns. This conference, I think, is a culmination and uh, a brilliant illustration of the way that in a very short time you have transformed our community. Where are you? I want to look at you. <laughs> and, um, and, we, and we thank you and we love you. Thank you. Um, we got a hard question, but a very, a very good one uh, and one that has inspired a lot of meditation. So I wanted to offer a few thoughts. We were invited to share our own work and the work of others we admire if we like. So I'm going to put a few ideas on the table and a few poems, some by me and some by other poets. In thinking about the I, uh, the, the vowel and what it does on the page, I first thought about the lyric I, the speaking voice from personal experience that we often see in poetry. But I thought that the vowel I was more interested in was the O, the way in which the O mirrors the open mouth singing, the way that the O, when you speak it in a word, literally opens the mouth, opens the body, brings song out of the body, and reminds us of the very reason that poetry exists in the first place. I wanted to think about if, if, if there was some kind of movement that I could trace from the singular I to the embodied and collective O. Here is one short poem of mine that gives uh, an illustration of what I mean by the way that the vowel forces song, brings us to song. This is called Ars Poetica number 88, Sublime. In a pickle, we talk our way out of our corners. We can the rough stuff. Overture, theme and variation, call and response, I equals we. 
girl could talk, sweet or savory, nutmeg or cinnamon, jalapeno or scotch bonnet, jalapeno or maraschino, angostura bitters. Sing your mouth and O oh, which bubbles, tra-la-la, or reaches low to where nobody knows. What a baby knows. The word as light, the word as vowel, the word as element, the need to sing. And so I think uh, that to a certain extent, of course, the making of a poem arises not just from the need to write, but for the need to sing and illustrates for us the way in which the poem is the vessel of the human voice opening and coming out from soul to soul. This is a poem by Rita Dove called O, oh, or I should properly say E, uh, because it is the O oh with an umlaut. Uh, that's the title of the poem, O, oh, with the two dots over it but I'm gonna call it O. Shape the lips to an O. Say A, that's island. One word of Swedish has changed the whole neighborhood. When I look up, the yellow house on the corner is a galleon stranded in flowers. Around it, the wind. Even the high roar of a leaf mulcher could be the horn blast from a ship as it skirts the misted shoals. We don't need much more to keep things going. Families complete themselves and refuse to budge from the present. The present extends its glass forehead to see backyard breezes, scattered cardinals. And if one evening the house on the corner took off over the marshland, neither I nor my neighbor would be amazed. Sometimes a word is found so right it trembles at the slightest explanation. You start out with one thing, end up with another, and nothing's like it used to be, not even the future. Read a dove, oh. And then, in taking this idea of the O oh and what it opens and its possibilities even further, I want to take us, I think, somewhere even deeper, a poem that many of you probably know, Audre Lorde's Cole. And I want you to think about in this, um, again, how we move from that I, the lyric I, to the O and all that it contains in it, coal. I is the total black being spoken from the earth's inside. There are many kinds of open, how a diamond comes into a knot of flame, how sound comes into a word colored by who pays for what is speaking. Some words are open like a diamond on glass windows, singing out within the crash of sun. Then there are words like stapled wagers in a perforated book, buy and sign and tear apart and come whatever will all chances. The stub remains, an ill-pulled tooth with a ragged edge. Some words live in my throat, breeding like adders. Others know sun, seeking like gypsies over my tongue to explode through my lips, like young sparrows bursting from shell. Some words bedevil me. Love is a word, another kind of open. As the diamond comes into a knot of flame, I am black because I come from the earth's inside. Now take my word, for jewel in the open light. Then, from that, I want to give you a few poems of mine. And again, I'm sort of putting all these forth for us to meditate on them together. These are a few poems from a, an epic poem uh, called The Amistad. Very, very nice not to have to give a lengthy explanation uh, about uh, the Amistad incident. Um, you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't. Um, and so, and again, thinking about uh, Sonia Sanchez's use of the vowel as keen or whale, the way in which if you have seen Sonia Sanchez read her poetry, you understand that those vowels on the page need to be embodied so that you can understand that part of what she is marking is the blank space, the horror, the wordlessness of the middle passage. 
when you think about the ways that she has those long, vowelly keens in that particular poem. And so in writing this poem um, uh, about the Amistad, um, I think that perhaps there are some ways I was trying to think about opening up that space that felt not necessarily unspeakable, uh, but that was quite simply the profound and sometimes wordless space of grief. And so how could that be marked in the poem? So I'm going to read just a few sections from that. Absence. In the absence of women on board, when the ship reached the point where no land mass was visible from any direction, and the funk had begun to accrue. Human funk, spirit funk, soul funk, who commenced the moaning? Who first hummed that deep sound from empty bowels, roiling stomachs, from back of the frantically thumping heart? In the absence of women, of mothers, who found the note that would soon be called blue, the first blue note, from one bowel, one throat, joined by dark others in gnarled harmony? Before the head rag, the cast iron skillet, new blue awaited on the other shore, invisible as yet unhummed. Who knew what note to hit or how? In the middle of the ocean, in the absence of women, there is no deeper deep, no bluer blue. The last quatrain, and where now, and what now, the black, white space. American sublime. And here the entire poem is in parentheses, a broken O, with something in between again attempting to fill that space. At the same time, American paintings wherein the biodynamic landscape explodes in flames. Ice, violent sunshine that seems to burn the canvas, apocalyptic nature that roils and terrifies. The beautiful, small scale, gentle luminosity. Sublime, territorial, vast, craggy, undomesticated, borderless, immense, unknown, awful, monumental, transcendent, transcending. Go west and west, young man, to blinding snowstorms. Leave shark-infested waters, shipwrecks without slaves. Miraculous black holes of color large enough to blot out the sun, obliterate the unending moans, to exalt, to take the place of lamentation. A short piece from something called the Toni Morrison Poems a reading at Temple University, and you'll see how this is also a meditation on the same. Love, she wrote, and love and love, and velvet, amanuensis, pantry, lean, Hagar, Shadrach, Jadine, Plum, Sh Runigate, Liver, Solomon, and then she whispered it, love. And then finally, I just want to, to close these beginnings um, with, in thinking about today, um, uh, two very short bits uh, from uh, a poem that takes us through these years we've been speaking about. So just two little bits. 1963. You tell me knees are important. You kiss your elders' knees in utmost reverence. The knees in the painting are what send the people forward, forward to a new place moving as one. Once progress felt real and inevitable, as sure as the taste of licorice or lemons. The people were marching in Birmingham, walking into a light both brilliant and unseen. April 5th, 1968.
The city burns. We have to stay at home. TV always interrupted by fire and helicopters. Men who have tweedled my cheeks once or twice join the serial dead. My father is away saving the world for Negroes, we say. We go downtown with mother. We stand in the burnt city. What a pretty little girl, say the tourists who are white. My shoes are patent leather, all shiny, black. My father is away saving the world for Negroes. I want to shout, it is 1968. We stand in the burning city. Thank you. Left. You are officially left for dead when a woman stands on a roof screaming for help for four days, pointing to the weak old baby in the bassinet each and every time the helicopter flies by and the grandmother fanning and breathing hard in the New Orleans Saints folding chair is waving a white handkerchief and the roof is surrounded by broken levee water and the woman is waving a homemade sign that says, please help, please. And even if the E has been left off of the please, do you know simply by looking at her that it has been left off because she can't spell or because the water was rising too fast and there wasn't time to put it there? and the helicopter that is catching all of this on tape, but not landing and not dropping any ladders because regulations require an E be at the end of any pleas before any national response can be taken. Therefore, it will take four days before anybody will drop one bottle of water or dehydrated baby formula on that roof where the E has rolled off and not splashed loud enough into the water, where four days later, not the mother and not the baby, but the one whom they were both named forever for and after, has been covered up in a bed sheet and pushed to the side near where the missing E was last seen. What else would you call it, Mr. Every Child Left Behind President? Anyone you know ever left out or put an E on a word by mistake? Potato, potato? Yes, this is no longer a poem. Yes, I am no longer paying attention to line breaks in metaphor or publication possibilities. One mad broken heart, one soaked face is writing at 2 a.m. I will never forget. I will always remember the grandmothers were right about everything. Even as you fly over burning San Diego, even as the fires are put out so well, as the people there wait in a civilized manner, even as they receive foie and free massage, as their houses burn to the ground, I will never forget how people were left screaming for their lives on rooftops. I will never forget how people died in the sun in the heat of absolute ne neglect while the flag of th the national abandonment waved wildly. In the summer of 2005, in the United States of America, while you were president, because it was only New Orleans, and therefore, who would be left alive to care? Con concerto number seven, Condoleezza working out at the water gate. <laughs> Condoleezza rises at four, stepping on the treadmill. Her long fingers brace the two slim handles of accommodating steel. She steadies her sleepy legs for the long day ahead. She doesn't get very far. Her knees buckle wanting back last night's dream. Dream number nine. She is 15, leaning forward from the bench. Mozart's piano concerto in D minor, alone before the gawking, disbelieving, applauding crowd. Not dream number two, she is nine and not in the church that explodes into dust, the heart pine floor giving way beneath her friend Denise, rocketing her up into the air like a jack in a box of a black girl wrapped in a cross. She ups the speed on the treadmill, 
remembering she has to be three times as good. Don't mix up your dreams, Condi. She runs faster back to the right, finally hitting her stride. Mozart returns to her side. She is 15 again, all smiles and recently moved to the peaks of the Rocky Mountains where she and the piano are the only black people in the room. Concerto number five, Intransigence, the Condoleezza Suite. At piano, you are a major sound, more than the articulate ivory key. Your head rolls right bank, leaning. You hear things that aren't there. On nightly TV, you open your mouth to sing. A brilliant delayed count lifts, then subsides. We take pride diving through your Shostakovich gap. At news conference, you and they, cheek to cheek, are guillotined and gutted, prepared, handled, then neatly trussed with jade and diamond thread. You are the fifth little girl of Birmingham, found recently with ligature marks beneath high court rulings, excavated with airbrush and Texas-sized picks by not one, but two closely related presidents, preserved forever in Washington marble and the panning lights of CNN, on display, the ruby, carrot, curio, fresh from the roiling rubble of integration. Tony K. Bambara was my only writing teacher. I never took a writing course in this life, but I made the journey to her house every Sunday for two years. It is because of Tony K. Bambara's presence in my life that I could write those three poems. On her deathbed, she wrote to me and she said, Nikki, do not leave the arena to the fools. In answer to today's question, I do not think we can leave our vowels to the fools. going to read first a series of poems about evil, about radical evil. What's the source of evil and what is the Christian response to evil? Um, this first one is called Photographs of the Medusa. And I'm sure everybody remembers that the, the only way to, to defeat the Medusa is to hold up a mirror so that the Medusa sees her own face. Column 6, page 36, shows you goateed and smirking. After 13 years on death row, your stare still dares the camera, unflinching and remorseless. A fish knife to that girl's throat, one hand fumbling your zipper. When she thrashed under your heartbeat, did you taste her blood? or your pleasure. And you, freckled little boy in aviator glasses, when you waylaid a playmate and bludgeoned him in the woods, was it fun, like killing cats? Was it like the bases loaded, you'd hit one out of the park? And you, prosperous young shipping company executive whose eyes are snake eyes too, when you sent 800 tons of milk powder unfit for human consumption to the Sudan to feed victims of famine, did you count it a profit 
or a thrill. Pedophiles and parasites, cannibals, perpetrators of atrocities, inhuman evil celebrities, just bad kids out for a good time. Your reptile eyes confront mine in the daily newspaper. What is it you think you know about yourselves, about me? That I no longer wince? That no ugliness is unimaginable? That my heart is turning to stone? And my God, my shield, my only mirror is my own face looking back with this simpleton love. No worst. The wicked stepmother bursts into her husband's daughter's room, grabs a fistful of matted hair, and hauls the little bitch out of bed late again. The God-starved priest reaches gasping ecstasy before a trembling 14-year-old carpenter's son. And random ghouls roam, body snatchers on the lookout for children to rape to torture, to murder, to devour. The Mahatma wrote that the only true weapon against evil is ahimsa, nonviolence, love. But how love the woman who holds a child's head under the bathwater? How love the man who stuffs a wadded sock into his daughter's sobbing mouth. How? No, don't ask for that. Good Christ, how shall I love the Nosferatu behind the mask of a neighbor's face? Like father, like son. It comes over him sometimes. He can't help it. It just comes over him and makes him want something, want to do something, something naughty, something bad. And whose God's going to grab his wrist and spank the back of his hand? Whose God's going to shake him to tooth chatter, slap his face snotty, say, you fucking little piece of shit? Whose God's going to make him be good? Whose God will see him tiptoe into a dark room, sit on a fragrant narrow bed, touch a dimpled arm, awaken the little secret, and let it come over him? Whose God cares enough to stop him? Where was your God when he needed one? He's a piece of shit, all right child of the only goddamn God he knows. Those were an exploration of evil, and when I got to the extremely depressing end of it, I thought <laughs> it would be <clears throat> worth while to, uh, to look at the other side of the spectrum, it seemed to me in, in uh, studying evil that there is no evil that some human being will not do if it's possible to do it. And I wanted to think about whether, there, whether there's a limit to our capacity for good. So I, I decided to write a saint's life. And the saint I chose is George Washington Carver. So I'll end with um, a couple of poems from Carver's life. This one is called Coincidence. In Wakefield, the night train screeches to a neck-wrenching halt. Last, the explanation reaches the colored compartment where Dr. Carver guards in a valise 
his jars of before and after soils and of compost, his giveaway bags of raw peanuts. Hearing down the car's long voice brigade a cry for help, he wonders what in all creation could make a whole family sit on the tracks to try to kill themselves. He gives thanks for the engineer's honed eyes. He looks down at the brown road map printed in his yellow palms. Your life may be the only Bible some people will know. He rises. The train arrives only two hours late. The Dimensions of the Milky Way Behind the men's dorm at dusk on a late May evening, Carver lowers the paper and watches the light change. He tries to see Earth across a distance of 25,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way, a grain of pollen, a spore of galactic dust. He looks around. That shag bark, those swallows, the fireflies, that blasted mosquito, this beautiful world. A hundred billion stars in a roughly spherical flattened disk with a radius of 100 light years. Imagine that. He catches a falling star. Well, Lord, this infinitesimal speck could fill the universe with praise. I'll uh, re read one, one more Carver poem and stop. This is called Goliath. Another lynching, madness grips the south. A black man's hacked off penis in his mouth, his broken body torched. The terrorized blacks cower and the whites are satanized. His students ask in Carver's Bible class, where is God now? What does he want from us? Professor Carver smiles. God is right here. Don't lose contact with him. Don't yield to fear. Fear is the root of hate, and hate destroys the hater. When Saul's army went to war against the Philistines, the Israelites lost contact, fearful of Goliath's might. When we lose contact, we see only hate only injustice, a giant so great its shadow blocks our sun. But David slew Goliath with the only things he knew, the slingshot of intelligence and one pebble of truth, and the battle was done. We kill Goliath by going about the business of the universal good which our Creator wills, obediently yielding to Him the opportunity to work wonders through us for all of His children. That's all. Read 1 Samuel 17:47. I'm not a poet, um, and I'm humbled to serve on the panel with um, women whose work I teach. And I wanted to offer three thoughts about writing, reading, and interpretation of texts as spiritual practice, and what this has to do with religion and faith and who we are. My first thought is that I am reminded 
as a scholar of African American religious history that what I believe in is that in the beginning there was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And so in dwelling in the words of literature, of poems, of novels, of protests, of screams, of cries, in dwelling within those words, we can view the face of God. And so as these three women have demonstrated, we hear in their poetry a spiritual voice that we need to guide us as we figure out who we are, where we are, and in whose we belong. And I also want to offer the interpretation for those of us who read these literary texts, who teach them, who ingest them, that the interpretation of these works as we consume them is participating in a hermeneutical process that as we interpret and we read and we consume these texts, I want to remind us that we are engaging in spiritual practice, that we are offering these words as prophetic voices in our communities. My second point that I want to make is that by looking at literature and by engaging these texts, we are also participating in filling in the gaps of our history, that where we are missing from the record books, where we are missing from the historical record, where we are missing from the pages at the county courthouse, men and women, black men, black women, committed to telling the truth can creatively reimagine spaces where there is absence. We were there whether the record recorded our presence or not. And so you have a Toni Morrison writing a beloved so that people will know where there was joy, there was sorrow. As Al Rabito would say, it was a sorrowful joy. And so whether or not the records of how American religious history has come about records our sorrowful joy, we know. And we see that in the works of writers who've had to creatively reimagine spaces where we've been denied a voice. And then I want to share my last story that as a scholar of religion and also as a scholar of literature, the intersection of those two things meet for me over the issue of representation. Asked to preach a few months ago, the pastor's assistant emailed me and she said, Yolanda, you didn't send me the text for your sermon. For those of you who are preachers, you know what I'm talking about. Everyone wants your text. What are the words that you're using to elucidate, to lift up, to preach from, to bring to the people? What elements of the biblical text are you using to give the good news? She probably shouldn't have asked me that question at that moment where she asked me that question because I wrote her back a long email and I told her the text that I was choosing to preach on that Sunday was the poem, We Have Been Believers by Margaret Walker. She emailed me back. She said, no, 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 I, I, you misunderstood. I need to know to put into the bulletin, what is your text? I said, I'm gonna try again. So I emailed her and I said, this is my text. She finally called me, perhaps thinking that the median of, you know, electronic mail wasn't working to my satisfaction. And she said, what is your text? And I said, listen, I said, I'm a Christian, I'm a minister, I'm a professor. I know the word, I read the Bible, I celebrate its richness. But there are times when I look at those words and I know that my face is not reflected therein. And so I go to the words of my friend and colleague, Nikki Finney, or I go to the words of someone like Margaret Walker, and in those words, I can lift out a text to bring a message to people. So I want to remind us that as we consider the words of these poets, that you all know that you're hearing the words of prophets for a new day.
And that as we participate in interpretation, we recreate a hermeneutical table. And so in those absences, our stories, our songs, our children, our ancestors, all of those stories can be told. They're missing other places. So the power and the capacity of interpreting these texts and listening to these stories is to recognize this is the work we have to do, and it begins with us. Thank you. Now I'd like to open up the microphones for people to make comments or ask questions to interact with the panelists. There are two microphones in the center there. While we're waiting for people to come to the microphones, I wanted to sort of think across what some of you were, um, were raising in incredibly rich ways in relation to the question. And so much of our literature has to speak into spaces of silence that I was also, and you, that's been addressed very eloquently and painfully and powerfully, but I was also wondering in relation to the question of the sort of space on the page, are there creative ways to incorporate silence through space, the space between our words, um, or are we always, always committed to not only not allow those fools to take our words, but to use words when perhaps we are trying to reach for a silence between words. Well, um, I, I think um, we've all learned a lot from uh, the poets of the black arts movement uh, in terms of the ways that Sonia Sanchez and Mary Baraka and others moving forward a bit to Entisaki Shange, in particular for me, uh, said, I am going to take this English language and do with it what I need to in order to incorporate the oral tradition, what I'm trying to say, the silences I'm trying to address, so that that meant capitalization was played with, that, that, that the poems did not look on the page like conventional poems, because they needed to break something open in order to bring forth the truth that they had to offer. So um, I think that that example um, is something that uh, came forward sometimes uh, not as brilliantly as they did it um, uh, into the poetics of today, but I think sometimes in a way that, for me at least, very powerfully modeled that the English language and American English is not a static thing. It doesn't belong to one tradition in particular, um, and that it has tremendous possibilities when it starts to attune itself to what sound and song especially um, have to give it. And so uh, that's, that sort of you know, broken typography is uh, one example of that. You know, I would, I would offer um, the issue of silences in, in thinking about it fairly broadly to say that um, for African American women in particular in spaces in which they were silent, silenced, actively silenced, that writing becomes the venue in which they participate in conversations which they often were not allowed to participate in. And so you see um, this engagement with silence, sometimes the act of choice to be silent and to sit with that silence, but sometimes this active engagement of saying, well, you know, we're 85, 90% of the church, 
but the denomination won't ordain us to be pastors or to say that we are doing the actual physical work of the civil rights movement and yet we are not called leaders. And so in those moments of silence, we see people writing their way into the historical record. They're writing what, what Bill Andrew calls a free story, right? That they're, they're choosing to enter into those silences, usually with the written text or sometimes even orally. Um, and that there are often times though in which the choice to be silent when it is not in force is a powerful choice, right? Which is that I choose not to speak at this moment and that I will choose to speak at another time, but that's a different, um, a different type of choice. So I love this notion when we receive the question of how does the space and the page and how do these words operate, that there are moments of enforced silence, but then there are moments of active silence, of seeking, of waiting, of engaging and choosing to speak. You know, and I think that comes across so powerfully um, in the writings, in particular by African American women. And also when I was thinking, Elizabeth, of your meditation upon um, O mm -hmm. um, in all its um, physicality as well as sort of power uh, um, as a symbol of the relation between poetry and song. Mm -hmm. um, and I just... I mean, both sort of like historically, but also the way in which um, orality um, is very present, even in the, m in the most sort of complicated um, renditions of the written, uh, that it's very, very present. Could I ask you before you ask your question or make a comment to just introduce yourself by name? Thank you. My name is Tracy West, and I want to uh, first thank all of you uh, for just an amazingly, you know, at this point in the day, one feels just a little bit, a little bit weary, though it's been exciting and energizing, and, um, but still there's just something about this point in the day and, and just the fresh way that you have brought us insight and energy and consciousness um, in this moment is just very exciting, so I want to thank you for that. And I have a question about the role of the poet in relationship to uh, freedom movement. I'm thinking of um, uh, uh, Professor Alexander, your earlier, earlier a few panels ago, earlier in the day where you were talking about freedom and you gave us that poetry. And so resonating a little bit with that comment, um, whether or not there is, what do you think of the idea of, of institutionalizing um, a need for a poet in, as, as part of, a resident part of any movement, any struggle, any organization, uh, any church, any, any classroom uh, that's about sort of liberative teaching? Um, is that too great a dissonance uh, with creativity? that one would institutionalize that role. It's just the, the, the way in which uh, the, the images uh, that you have given us, uh, the way in which you've al allowed us to understand uh, socio-political realities um, in, that, that we just don't have access to um, other than through poetry and the way in which you've used language. It seems to me that, that every effort of, of teaching and learning and cognizance and struggle, um, every political effort uh, that we're talking about uh, here needs to have in some way to be infused with that presence. Uh, so do you know what I'm trying to ask you and, and what do you think of that idea? Um, well, I mean, I think communities do need the bardic presence. Uh, and I think we've seen that across culture and across time. And that even when it's not officially institutionalized, it, it sometimes happens, right? That, that, that communities know who the person is who has the gift or the way with words, who has not only the gift of insight, but I think, you know, a certain kind of courage 
that says that you're willing to, to go to that insight which sometimes seems very strange and peculiar and unfamiliar when you lift it up out of the muck and commit it to, uh, to, to something that has form. Um, I know, I, I wonder what you all think, but I know that, that for me in the making of poems, there is often that, that, that really frightening moment where you think this thing that came out of me is unrecognizable to me, but I made it. And then you are its mother, <laughs> you know, a, a, after you sort of pass through that moment. So um, I think that, that, that it's, it, it, it is important for communities to recognize, you know, Auden, of course, said um, poetry. Well, there's the Auden quote and the, the William Carlos Williams quote. Um, Auden says, poetry makes nothing happen, but people die every day for lack of what is found there. Is that correct? Or am I conflating the two? That is correct. Well, we'll make it correct for today. <laughs> poetry makes nothing happen, but people die every day for lack of what is found there. And so from that I also take, you know, we have lived for the last eight years with a president who does not value, cannot use the word, uh, because in part, I think, uh, you know, if, if the true word that were to match his deeds were to come out from him, it would be such a beast that no one would follow him down this road of destruction that he's taken us down all this time. So instead what we have is almost uh, an aphasic president, you know, someone who is without language because any true language that would come from him would be monstrous. So, you know, I think that, that, that to, to, to go back to think about what does it mean for a human being to speak his or who, her true word and true voice and say, here it is. And I have taken the time to be precise so that I may give my soul to you in hopes that you will give it back to me. I think that that sort of writ large is part of, part of the work of, of poetry and that maybe that exists on a kind of a spectrum. Um, you know, with poets making poems at one place on the spectrum and people uh, just trying to communicate hard and difficult truths to each other along the spectrum. I just wanted to add to, to that, um, Elizabeth, the institutionalized, you know, that, that word. I'm a poet because in my community there were poets everywhere and they weren't all writing, you know. They were in the pulpit, they were at the corner store, they were speaking in this lovely lilting language and, you know, to say the word poetry sometimes we get really afraid. I mean, I was, I was afraid sitting up here that nobody would ask us the poets a question. Mm. You know, it's like, are they worried about what to ask? Are they think, are they gonna fall into this great big pit? You know, the last panel had, you know, people out the door and around the corner and I was like, oh no, the poets have made us afraid to, you know, engage. No, that didn't, isn't the, the, the point because there's a, a lovely line there now. But in this country, <laughs> It just takes a little while, right? But in this country, you say the word poetry and people go, you, 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 tr you interpret it, you answer that, you know, and, and yet it lives in all of us. So we don't have to leave it to institutions. You know, I grew up in a time where my mother read to me every night, you know, story. Uh, I, I had an interview with Lucille Clifton who talked about her mother was a poet. The reason she is a poet is because her mother was a poet and read to her the poems of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, recited them by heart. What happened to that? I grew up in the church. Easter Sunday, I had, a, I had to write a poem. Uh, uh, you know, it was a bad poem, but I still wrote it. And I got, I got touched by, you know, the good sister on row five to say, you're going to write a poem next Sunday. Okay. So you are given the responsibility, you're given the mantle, and then I grew up feeling like, this is okay, I could do this. And every step along the way, somebody put their hands on me to say, you can do this. Now, we don't really teach, especially black students, creative writing, unheard of. You, black students go home and say, mom, I wanna be a poet, and they say, come here, honey, sit down. <laughs> you know, so the institutional stuff is one thing, but at home, you know, there should be a po yeah, a poet should be on every corner. A poet is on every corner. It's just how we need to change our language, how we need to see each other in a different light. Um, 
So let us think about how we might change the definition sometimes of giving the power away to other people and other things when we have the power within us to create those worlds that we wish to see exist. Having, having myself had an institutional position as a poet, I, I, I this last year finished a five-year term as poet laureate of the state of Connecticut, which was a nice honor. Um, uh, when I once I finally figured out what I could do with it. Um, it was even a better honor because at the, at the beginning of it, I had a lot of people saying, well, you're the official state poet. Yeah, would you write this? Would you come and do this? Will you? And um, they weren't really interested in uh, seeing a, a poet as a truth teller, as someone who struggles to bring true words out of silence. I, I, my relationship with that silence is, the, is my sense that, that there is this vast silence and that if I can make myself quiet enough that a word f will form in that silence for me to bring into this world. Um, but they weren't looking for that. They were looking for somebody to entertain them. And uh, when I, when I um, finally figured out how I could use this institutionalized position to bring out of silence the untold stories of African Americans uh, who have lived and suffered in, in the state of Connecticut, um, then it turned into something that I felt was worth doing. I had to find that, though, I had, and I had to find the stories to, uh, to bring into the world. Um, so um, uh, on, on the one hand, I, I would uh, shy away from the, the idea that, that a poet should have an institutionalized place. I think in some ways it's healthier for the poet to remain on the margin and to be responsible only to the silence, to listen to that silence which has a voice uh, which I don't think it's only poets who who can hear that voice but I think um, poets train themselves as mystics and prophets and preachers do and re all religious people uh, to listen to shut up all of the little voices saying go shopping buy this do that you know you need this um, to, to quiet those voices and listen to that silence. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the beginning of my sentence. <laughs> Thank you to each of the panelists so much for sharing your work and allowing us here to embody the spaces in which we have been talking about throughout the entire uh, conference. My name is Melanie Harris, and I teach womanist ethics and black religion at Texas Christian University, which in the news recently has been a very difficult place to bring race and the conversations that we're having here today to the classroom. My question, though, to the panelists is that I am very aware that in womanist thought and womanist ethics in particular, womanist thought and the way of thinking about womanism is also expressed in poetry. This is the case for Dolores S. Williams, and certainly the case for Emily Towns, in which, in her latest work, Womanist Ethics, A Cultural Production of Evil, one, as a reader, must have a special sense of being able to read, and very, very easily, actually, in her work, poetry and academic discourse or intellectual um, ideas. I do know, though, that this is a challenge for many academics, and Kwok Prilong, an Asian feminist, talked about this in an AAR article uh, a few months ago in, in the RSN, talking about how we as religious scholars really need to open up the way that we talk, and that what a wonderful model that Dr. Towns offers and other womanist scholars offers. I want to ask the question of how academics, how we scholars, how those of us who ingest knowledge and reproduce knowledge in a very systematic way 
can shift, can transform so that we can read better. That's a wonderful question. Um, I, I would add a, um, a couple of suggestions. Um, one is that we start taking people's words seriously, even if they, if those words are not produced in places that are quote unquote peer reviewed. Mm. See mm. what I'm saying? Mm. Mm. So what I'm suggesting is that 150 years before the establishment of womanist scholarship, mm. Maria Stewart was doing womanist work. Mm. Mm. And so when we take those two things apart, the place of the production of the text from the significance of the text, then we start seeing a wealth of material available to us in the classroom, right? And so, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a new school scholar, you know, I've been a scholar only in the academy for, for 10 years, and so I bring DMX to the classroom because to me, on his, some of his CDs, DMX is offering some prayers unlike anything I've heard in the church, and I'm a preacher, okay? And so I think that part of this process for us is to suggest that there are other places, other venues, other voices that do this kind of work, even if we fail as scholars to recognize that that work is in fact being done. And so those are the street poets, and those are the sisters who were, you know, on the subway writing stories, hoping somebody would publish them, but are just writing from the depths of their soul. And those are our grandmother stories, and those are the 80-year-old women sitting on the church pulpit and church pew who have stories to tell, but no one has come to collect their stories because we don't even care. And so I'm just suggesting that at least part of our process is to recognize that all scholarship doesn't happen in the academy and that we are the less off if we don't avail ourselves to, to the material that's out there, those prophetic voices that are coming from places that we don't think prophets come from. Mm. Prophets come from the street, mm. right? Yeah. I just wanted to add one thing too, um, is that I think uh, if we teach art as theory, uh, that that is very, very useful and very, very illuminating. Um, if you, and there are any number of different examples um, that, that we can use. If you think about uh, poetry as containing philosophy, as containing, you know, Marilyn spoke about the gaps in history, um, as uh, containing uh, uh, epistemologies of ways of looking at the world. Um, one of my most, most, most important uh, people whose work is with me all the time is Gwendolyn Brooks. And, you know, any line of hers, I mean, they start sort of coursing around in my head. Um, her, her great poem, Kitchenette Building, you know, we are things of dry hours and the involuntary plan, grayed in and gray, not strong. Dream makes a giddy sound, not strong like rent, feeding a wife, satisfying a man, but could a dream rise up through onion fumes? A and so on. So, I mean, we can talk for days and days and days about all that is analyzed in that moment. You know, we can talk about how she is an incredible reader of sociological Chicago in the 1940s in those very few lines, and so forth and so forth and so on. So, people's, people's brains have different shapes. You know, people's, people's wisdom comes from different angles. And so I think that if we recognize that the vessel uh, of critical thinking doesn't always come in critical essays and books, that that's a very useful way to learn to be a much better critical thinker. My name is Avril Clark, and I teach sociology here at Yale. And um, I'm, I really enjoyed all of your work and everything that you had to say. I've enjoyed most of the conference <coughs> that I've heard also. Um, my question is actually about whether you find, <coughs> as authors, a connection between, um, a tension between 
the rules of your, and I say discipline because I'm sort of struggling to sort of finish my book, so I'm trying to become a writer, and, and truth. Like, is there a tension there, and is that something you exploit? Um, or do the rules of language, you, you know, you talked, um, Dr. Alexander, about sort of breaking something open, right? Is there, are there rules that make it more difficult or um, maybe sometimes impossible to speak your truth? Um, does that ever happen? And how do you handle that tension if it does exist? have one thought about poetic license, which is to say that, you know, uh, often there are things in poems that do not literally correspond to the truth as we experience it in real life, if you will. So, you know, I might need to write a poem with you in it, but I'm not going to put you in a red jacket because my poem needs you to be in a blue jacket. Um, but what I think what you do have to, to, to learn a, 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 as a writer is how to listen for the kind of fundamental and essential truth. Um, and I do think that's something that at the bottom line we have to, you know, we, we know when we've written false notes or we strive to know when we've written false notes, which is different from a kind of empirical truth sometimes. That's one thought. Yeah, intention is good. You know, conflict makes art. I work with tension. I, I like, I don't, I don't avoid it. I don't, I'm not trying to avoid it when I'm um, writing something. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole thing about rules. I mean, my 10th grade English teacher told me that I had to, you know, learn all the rules of grammar before I broke them. Right. And I believe that to this day, that then you know, you know, exactly what you're breaking. Um, and I have huge struggles with my students about that. But it's a, I think it's a truth that, you know, remains a present for me, and I try to impart that to them. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if I have anything to add to this, except that uh, for me, the rules are something to play with. Mm. And um, I, while I'm busy playing with the rules on on one level, I'm also allowing what I think of as a deeper truth to, to emerge. And um, I, I, I write mostly in traditional European forms in the last few years, and so I'm busy working on rhymes, you know, trying to find the right rhymes. But meanwhile, I'm opening, I'm, I'm keeping my inner door open to that truth that I'm seeking, it's, it, it, it's hard to explain because it's as if your mind is, is divided while you're working. And on, on the one hand, half you know, three quarters of your brain is working on putting these words together and making them powerful somehow. But the other quarter of your mind is saying, please let this be true. Please let me be open to the deeper truth. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Thanks. If I could just add one word, I think also the poetic and creative imagination can break open what appears to be the truths of other just disciplines and worldviews. And I was thinking um, Patrick Chamoiseau in that wonderful novel Texaco has a figure who's an urban planner. And this figure cannot begin to apprehend or understand the truths of a community that he moves into with these truths of urban planning about developing the community in ways that will actually destroy it, the truths as he understands it about the land on which these people are, but having no understanding of the people. And Patrick Chamoiseau does not have this urban planner 
begin to understand this community until he's transformed into a poet. Because there are, there are truths until he opens up his mind in that way that he's completely blind to and has been made blind by the quote-unquote truths of the ways in which he's been trained. Good afternoon. My name is Marcus T. McCullough. I'm a first year Master's of Divinity student at Harvard Divinity School. Um, I wanted to thank you all for reminding us of the power of words, particularly the power of uncensored words. And it actually um, leads into my question. Um, as an MDiv student, I'm always thinking about the church, thinking from a ministerial context. And I feel like a lot of times we don't give people in the church the room to do that kind of expression. And I think it's extremely powerful if we do. So my question is, how do you as poets see the church benefiting from opening a space for uncensored poetic expression? And if you do see that possibility, do you think that's a good way to support hip hop, specifically rap, coming into the, the church? <laughs> I'm sorry? I said there's a lot up in that question. Yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever you're willing to tackle, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you're willing to tackle. Mm -hmm. I'll take a stab at it. Um, I, um, what, what tradition do you come from, brother? What denominational uh, tradition? AME, probably. Okay. Um, I asked not to put you on the spot or none oh, of the <laughs> AMEs on the spot. Um, but in, in many traditions, and, and yours is one of them, there is um, a testimony tradition um, where folk are given the opportunity, usually on a Wednesday night, um, to give their testimony, right? Right, to testify. And um, we, we've abandoned that almost in a wholesale in most of our churches. We have the business of church. Um, we have Sunday morning service, um, but we've abandoned that testifying tradition. And I'm only pointing that out to simply say there used to be ways in which people could tell their stories, could share their sorrowful joys, right? Um, could poetically engage. And um, in our rush to institutionalize um, the way that we now do church, I think we have neglected to create alternative spaces like those in which people could perhaps tell their story, besides the pastor who gets to tell his story all the time. Um, and so I would just, and, um, my grandmother said, um, tell the truth and shame the devil, so that, that's the truth. Um, so I think I would just um, urge the, the um, return to having more opportunities for people to be able to share in whatever form. And so that also includes young people, right, who may want to share in a way that's different than the testifying tradition, um, but that they should have the opportunity to do so. And when we fail to do so, we look around and we see our churches are devoid of people between the ages of 12 and 40. And we wonder why, because they don't have a space to tell the stories in the way that they want to tell their stories. And so reinvestigating how we can do testimony, right? Give a testimony in whatever respect, I think speaks to the need um, for, at least um, in the Christian churches, for that to still be a possibility. Thank you. Vernice Cosi Pulley. I'm beginning to feel like mother time. <laughs> Speak on. Speak on. But on this very special day, I'd like to mention a person who indeed was a genius, a poet, a master at using silence, who much impacted the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, and that was Dr. Howard Thurman. I have been in touch with his daughter who lives in New York, his widowed daughter named for Olive Schreiner. She is Olive Wong. And she tells me that in Boston, a lady has been working 14 years on a documentary of his rich life, his eight 
28 books and so forth. And so perhaps this is a rich tradition that we would do well to explore. Many have spoken today as mothers. I could share with you a reaction because after the assassination of Dr. King, my husband, who had been very much an ecumenical leader in our hometown of New Rochelle, New York, was working with the Trinity Presbyterian Choir of Rochester, New York, who had scheduled a concert in New Rochelle, but because of the assassination of Dr. King, they made it a memorial concert. And as we were working in the office, our eight-year-old son came through and he said, Mommy, will people write poems and music and plays about Dr. King? I said, oh yes, they'll write many poems, many plays, and we'll hear of him forever, probably. And he said, well, I have a poem right now. And he uttered this poem, and I said, well, let's write it on a yellow pad. And we did. And did I say this was my late son? And these were the words he wrote. Martin and Jesus came both to please us on this holy day. But when ten men came to town, it was like in the bay. Sadness and gladness turned the cruel world upside down. And now the world still has not pleased Jesus. The poem was published in his Presbyterian Sunday School, though we were lifelong Baptists, but we wanted them to know as children that the church was neither black nor white. It was both and all. And so our poor kids had to go to a Presbyterian Sunday school and stay until 1 or 1.30 at a Baptist service. And then I tease and say when they grew up, they rejected both of them. <laughs> but I wanted to share with you that his report card, that term from his teacher, indicate that he does not express himself well on paper. If there were time, I would share with you a poem that meant the world to me when I was not quite formally an adult, and it's called To Be Alive in Such an Age by Angela Morgan. But not having time, I just like to confess, perhaps in this sacred space, that a few years ago, some scholars, women scholars at the University of Indiana, put together two volumes called Black Women in America. And those scholars are still very much with us. Some were at the University of Indiana, uh, one Michigan State, etc. You probably know who I mean. But the publication of these two volumes is so profound. I have said over and again to people that I find it just as inspiring as I do the Bible. And the Bible has been basic to my existence. And I would challenge those of you, the book's out of publication. You know, the uh, capitalists got into the act, and I think it was... Um, Oxford University Press has gained the rights and they're putting out a book that costs $50 for $300. Anyhow, that's another story. But it is wonderful and it's in most our public libraries. And I don't know if any of you could comment on black women in America as a rich source of spiritual testimony, life and witness to the experience of we of the diaspora. I was wondering as we're I'm just keeping my eye on the time and how many questions there are left, if we could actually take a couple of questions and then hear responses to them, would that be all right? Okay, can we go to the next question, please? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Horace Ballard. I'm a student here at Yale in the Institute of Sacred Music, and I want to say thank you to all the panelists for your beautiful work and for sharing your words with us. 
And I was reminded, particularly because of the last panel, of the words of Nikki Giovanni, her elegy for Martin Luther King, in which she puts right out there, this is a sacred poem. Bow your head, close your eyes, take off your shoes, I, 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 I have a dream. So the words dream and I for her are very resonant. And then the words of Nishaka Shange, when she said, I found God in myself, and I loved her. I loved her fiercely. And so I wanted to ask you, your own opinions, what words are sacred to you when we're talking about the, the interplay between gender and sacredity? What words for you are sacred in your own work? What words call you back to yourself and then let you see forward as well? Thank you. What words are sacred to you? Okay, take another one, and then. Yes, um, I have a question. Um, my name is Lorena Mass, by the way. Um, just, uh, I'm thinking of, um, as I'm sitting here, about Maya Angelou's uh, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Um, I'm sure we all know uh, that writing. Um, because, uh, of course, the bird has a song. Um, can silence or the space we're referring to represent the lack of a song or not having a song um, in one's spirit? Also, do we sing less because we're no longer in that cage? Is there just one more question? Mm -hmm. Because then if we take that, then I think we can... I want to turn over to the panelists and maybe leave them room and for, to read another poem. Hi, I had a question about, uh, the question I think about um, sort of page and space and word and to think if, to ask if you ever think about translation. This question occurred to me when someone mentioned song because in my religious tradition I probably learned every song orally. And when I switched to, my family switched to a different denomination that actually sang from a book, I realized that my understanding of many of those hymns was incorrect, right? But there's something about the way I've learned them that I actually like more than the way I read them. And I was just wondering if, you know, as we all struggle to think about snippets of poetry and song that we've learned, and maybe it's not quite right, but we still like them, if you think about when you're writing your poems, right, what snippets or how it may be translated or understood in ways that you did not intend. And if that happens, do you think it matters if they still resonate in some important way? So that's my question. Okay, responses? I like the question um, about uh, the sacred uh, words. It makes me think of, um, of Baraka's poem, Kaaba, which ends, what will be the sacred words? So that the quest for, uh, for those words is, is, is ongoing, um, that it's something that, that we're always uh, listening for. Um, that said, um, to me, I suppose, uh, you know, writing poems is a form of meditation and worship and reverence and offering and prayer um, and of always um, uh, uh, trying to find um, the exact word that has a kind of luminosity, um, even if it is illuminating something terrible um, that can, you know, kind of make the poem something that's uh, luminous. I just keep coming back to, to that word, though I don't think actually I've ever used it in a poem, but it's, it's a principle, mm -hmm. I, I suppose. Mm -hmm. To the question about uh, the last question, you write a poem for the poem so that you can make it as clear and brilliant and strong and right there. And many, many, many times folks come up to you and say, I read that poem and it was about, you know, I, I love that it was about the peacock. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it wasn't about a peacock. <laughs> But it's okay, because poetry, you know, the, the, we've gotten to the place where, you know,
poetry is not just about what I said to you about the, the, the first poem I read, take that, about Katrina, about those words in that. It's about what you know, too, what you bring to it, what you, know, what you heard, what you, what you will leave here with from all of, of this work, what sacred words you'll take out of here. So it's not just about what I say to you on the page, it's what you see on the page, what, you, what matters to you that you then leave with. And if I work hard enough on the page to get it right, and that poem can stand on its own when I leave the room, then I've done my job. Because there's no way I could write for every heart and head in this room. Somebody would want some French. Somebody would want some gala in it. Somebody would want some, uh, uh, you know, theological terms. That's not the poem. The poem that I read is the one that I worked really, really hard on and let go. And then you heard it and left with some piece of it to take maybe out into the world. So the song, I, I love what you said, Melinda, about you like that, the, the singing, the oral tradition more because it got into your heart. And it is also part of the song, the, the lineage of songs that raised you. So that's what you hold on to. That's not wrong. You know, that's the tradition that you came out of, that I, come, that I came out of, that all of us, you know, perhaps came out of but we don't always honor it. We don't always honor it, and we're not teaching enough, I think, the power of that, which is what, in that question about, the, the sister asked about how do we get to read more, you know, how do we read differently? You've got to trust how you got here. You've got to trust, you don't have to get a stamp of approval on that, because you're here, and the more we use that, I think the more we um, will understand um, what, what's going to happen in the future with us? Um, about, I actually think all of these questions are related. Um, the, the first question, which words are, are sacred for each of us? I think language itself is sacred. It it's, it's enables us to relate to the world. It enables us to relate to the divine. It is the way we see. And so it's, it's not a question, I think, of, of any individual word which is necessarily more sacred than other words. It is whether a word can be, as Elizabeth said, made luminous. It's made luminous by the context. And the context is something that the writer discovers and struggles with in the attempt to make a word take on some, some light. Mm -hmm. But once the word is pronounced, it becomes something you hold in your hand uh, like a butterfly, and you have to let it go. And if it's a luminous word, if you've made it carry light, then it carries light wherever it goes. I keep thinking of a story I read once, long years ago, in the, in the New Yorker, a little story about somebody who said he was, he was going down the stairs into a subway stop, and there was a butterfly down underground in this subway stop, and everybody was stopped by the fact that there was this butterfly. And that if we recognize the poverty of others, the fact that others are still encaged, then we are ourselves still encaged. And that the, that it's, it, it is not, it's not true that we are no longer in a cage. As long as we have our hearts open to the fact of oppression, the continuing oppression, not only in this country, but in the world, that we, we are complicitous in the sufferings of people all over the world as the ocean level rises, as the planet becomes warmer. Um, we are in the same cage as the San people in the Kalahari, whose world is becoming too, it's, it's making it impossible for them to live. Um, so the world, as, as long as there are people 
encaged. We are encaged. And it's necessary for us to keep singing, to keep producing poetry, to fight that. I was uh, hoping that the last words of this panel could actually be poetry. So could I impose on Marilyn and um, Nikki and Elizabeth to actually read one more poem each, please? Marilyn? I'm sorry, I have to find a poem to read. This is called Dusting. Uh, thank you for these tiny particles of ocean salt, pearl necklace viruses, winged protozoans, for the infinite, intricate shapes of sub-microscopic living things, for algae spores and fungus spores bonded by vital mutual genetic cooperation, spreading their inseparable lives from equator to pole. My hand, my arm, make sweeping circles. Dust climbs the ladder of light. For this infernal, endless chore, for these eternal seeds of rain. Thank you for dust. The new cotton. Getting a reputation, I think. <laughs> they are just boys, chain gang to the side of the road, dressed to the nines in sunny orange, that shade of red that never seems to set. Familiar color of that foreign flower, the kind you can close your eyes and sleep and still see, but these boys are not flowers anymore. No thing can be seen to bloom has been left to bloom in this place where a chain around a black man's ankle is the state jewel. But if you still own your eyes, you know they are still boys. They do not yet know how to bend. Someone has not yet passed on the secret of how to save their backs for the rest of the journey. Someone forgot to offer the old way of how to get through the whip of their young days in order to reach the sweet rock of their old. They angle and arc carelessly, not knowing they are matchsticks of American history. Never squatting down low in the grass, never bending at the ankle or thigh, they are such proud, brittle, lion trees about to break in every direction but free. The weave of all their fabric wasted in the constant picking up of useless plastic things, that as I get closer, that as I pass, look white and sticky plump, some kind of new cotton stuck inside their reaching Robeson hands. This is called The Dream That I Told My Mother-in-Law. Mm. In the room almost filled with our bed, the small bedroom, the king-size bed, high up and on casters, so sometimes we would roll. In the room in the corner of the corner apartment on top of a hill so the bed would roll, we felt as if we might break off and drift, float, become our own continent. 
When your mother first entered our apartment, she went straight to that room and libated our bed with water from your homeland. Soon she saw in my cheeks the fire and poppy stain, and soon thereafter on that bed came the boy. Then months, then the morning I cracked first one, then two, then three eggs in a white bowl, and all had double yolks. And your mother, now our mother, read the signs. Signs everywhere, signs rampant, a season of signs in a vial of white dirt brought across three continents to the enormous white bed that rolled and now held three and soon held four, four on the bed, two boys, one man, and me. Our mother reading out all signs and blessing our bed, blessing our bed filled with babies, blessing our bed through her frailty, blessing us and our bed, blessing us and our bed. She began to dream of childhood flowers, her long gone parents. I told her my dream in a waiting room. A photographer photographed women, said her portraits revealed their truest selves. She snapped my picture, peeled back the paper, and there was my son's face, my first son myself. Mama loved that dream, so I told it again. And soon she crossed over to her parents, sisters, one son. War took that son. We destroy one another. And women came by twos and tens, wrapped in her same fine white, bearing huge pans of stew, round bread, homemade wines, and men came in suits with their ravaged faces, and together they cried and cried and cried and keened and cried, and the sound was a live hive swelling and growing, all the water in the world, all the salt, all the whales, and the sound grew too big for the building and finally lifted what needed to be lifted from the casket and we quieted and watched it waft, waft up and away like feather, like ash. Daughter, she said when her journey began, you are a mother now and you have to take care of the world. Could I please ask you to thank Yolanda Pierce, Marilyn Nelson, Nikki Fudge, Finney, and Elizabeth Alexander.